All right, everyone, we are recording. Uh, I would like to welcome Raj Iyer. Let me go ahead and put your bio in the chat real fast so everyone can read along. Now, uh, Raj Iyer has over 20 years of collegiate teaching experience in the US and India, including East Florida State, IIT Delhi, and colleges in the San Francisco Bay Area with courses on critical thinking and critical and creative thinking, perspectives on knowledge, philosophy of religion, theory and practice of engineering ethics and other philosophy courses. Raj, we welcome you today. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Oh, go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you, Beth. Uh, greetings and salutations to all. It is a pleasure and a joy, it always is, uh, to come back to this Unitarian Church. Unitarians have always been very special in my heart. Why? <clears throat> I mean, one could ask, ask the question, why the Unitarian Universalists? I mean, why are they so special in my personal cosmology? Well, one major reason is that you represent disparate cosmologies, disparate ways of thinking, belief systems. Some of you are Darwinian atheists. Some of you are humanists without a particular position on religion. Some of you are thinking theists. Some of you are neo-Wiccans. Some of you are new agers. I mean, uh, men know this. So there is a written law of different beliefs, and yet oddly enough, in spite of the conflictual processes that might come out in committee meetings and so forth, there is a harmony that unites all these different, that is so precious in this day and age when belief of people arise and nations are divided from each other in the midst of this corona pandemic as never before. You know, we're slowly recovering from all that. And, you know, the move from Trump to Biden is certainly a very welcome progression in the right direction. But uh, to find a group and several groups all across the United States, the UUs, uh, that, that are able to coexist and to teach others the meaning of coexistence, you know, when everything else seems to be falling apart and people don't want to coexist, People want to fight, people want to polarize, people want to say uh, we're superior, they are inferior. The old ethnocentric game, it's very refreshing to find uh, the UU oasis always. And so it's a pleasure. Obviously, it would be a greater pleasure to join you in person, but this is good enough for right now. And as Beth said, you know, we need to appreciate our blessings wherever we find them, yeah, as opposed to crying for the moon. And indeed, that is one of the themes of my of my chat. Uh, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Uh, it's coming up tomorrow. And yeah, <laughs> um, certainly a lot has been accomplished in terms of, uh, you know, the feminist movement and fighting for women's rights. Much has been accomplished, particularly in the so-called first world. But worldwide, there's a lot that needs to be done. And even within the United States and Europe, as we all know, there's much more that needs to be done in terms of ensuring equality and equity for women. The barbaric culture of rape and harassment so prevalent in many countries, including India. I mean, that really needs to be challenged and confronted at every stage. Uh, and we need to move beyond the gains that we already have. Um, coming to the theme of my talk today, I would say that many of us remain in denial about the great rupture caused by COVID-19. I mean, we tend to bury it under the carpet by saying, I'm really enjoying working from home in my pajamas. I really love the fact that the earth is breathing again and there's no noise on the streets and you know, it's so peaceful. Uh, all that might be true, I mean, at a certain level. And yet there's also a denial of one very significant shattering that's happened. And that is the, our we being, our being with the other. Uh, that has been radically undermined thanks to the corona pandemic. Uh, 
it's, I wouldn't say it's a disappearance, but it's certainly a problematization. When you see someone wandering around with a mask and they sneeze uh, very close to you, I mean, you very often there's a tendency to go into a panic. Oh my God, am I infected now? Should I get tested? Uh, the, the very presence of the other, even with a mask on, has a question mark after it. The live presence, this is safe, this is sanitized, this is Zoom. Um, and so we are replacing live physical interaction and touch with this. I remember another pandemic a few years ago, and I was an educational activist in Brevard uh, for the HIV cause, you know, dispelling a lot of prejudices and myths about HIV with students and community members in Brevard County. And, uh, but, but that was not so extreme in its proscription of touch. Sure. You know, we kept uh, singing the mantra of safer sex, but safer sex is one thing and radical touch phobia, where I'm afraid of touching my nose or touching anything pertaining to you, uh, even shaking hands. The macho knuckle bang has come to replace the hug and the uh, hug and the handshake. And that is so sad. There was such a radical impoverishment of our being because of our incapacity to be with the other physically, thanks to the pandemic. Um, and of course, the you know all the way from Martin Buber to Levinas, the human face and the human touch and that sense of I thou is built up only because I am physically in the presence, in the grace of the other. Uh, if you take that away and replace it with, with Zoom or Skype or WhatsApp, video chat or audio chat, it's not the same thing, is it? So that I think is, is, is really something we need to come to terms with. And also the fact that when we do return to a semblance of, the, of normalcy, uh, you know, where we're able to touch again and so forth, maybe in a year or two, uh, will we be willing to do it? Uh, we're so used to the knuckle bang that a whole and whole generation is now growing up with that kind of touch phobic universe, lived universe. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether some of us will find it extremely hard to go back to a, I mean, a hug sounds so weird, so unnatural now. I mean, so dangerous, so fraught with peril. <laughs> I could die because I hugged you. Uh, so these are questions that, that keep recurring in my mind. And of course, another problem that has been posed by philosophers in terms of the corona pandemic, apart from touch phobia and the disappearance of physical conversation and contact, is that right-wing autocratic states have claimed what the philosopher Giorgio Agamben calls states of exception. This is a state of exception, so I can declare an emergency. And indeed, lockdowns have been context for politicians to seize great amounts of power. And there's been a lot of abuse of authority in many, many states. In Hungary, Viktor Orban declared a state of emergency and proclaimed himself to be a dictator quite cheerfully and shamelessly. Uh, later, he had to revise that. But nonetheless, there was a period when Hungary was formally declared to be a dictatorship in a state of exception caused by a health crisis. And to me, that's very, very sad, very sad indeed. Um, uh, so we're looking at norms that have completely reformulated and reshaped us. The question is how can traditional philosophers help us? Certainly there's the whole lived, the phenomenology of the collapsed physical contact there's the phenomenology of right-wing autocracies and all the suffering caused to very innocent people on the street. But can philosophy actually help us cope? Can philosophy actually help us go within and find a sense of peace, even in the middle of all this turmoil? I think it can. Uh, and the first philosophy that I'd like to address in this context is Buddhism. And you go back to the words of the Buddha, you know, uh, more than 2,500 years ago, 
uh, you find that there is a strange comfort because the Buddha is uncompromising in saying that suffering is the, at the very heart of existence. Dukkha, sorrow, suffering is at the heart of being human and of existing. So if we're having a good time, you know, it's, the Buddha is not denying that you can have a good time situationally or temporarily. If you are healthy, if things are going hunky-dory for you, if you've just won the Florida lottery, all that is fine. But it's not going to last. This is the whole point of early Buddhism, of Theravada Buddhism, that you underlying all that is the worm of decay, of impermanence, of transience. It's all going to be taken away from you. And of course, the, the specters, <laughs> The Buddhist specters are old age, disease, and death. The first three of the four signs in Theravada Buddhism. And they're always knocking at our door. Even if we think we have it good, even if we think we're, life is a bubble, can't get any better, there's always that. So I think we could reconcile ourselves to this crisis by saying there's nothing new about disease. There's nothing new about plagues and pandemics. You know, uh, thanks to WhatsApp, the University of WhatsApp, as I like to call it, we exaggerate the importance of this particular pandemic. Undoubtedly, it's important for us, but I think we exaggerate it. And we see a uniqueness about it, which it perhaps lacks. I mean, when you see that disease has been the lot of human beings since the beginning, and pandemics are nothing new. I mentioned HIV, but they've, they've been plagues before, there's been leprosy, there's been TB, there's all kinds of diseases that have afflicted humankind. Very recently, SARS and H1N1, no one talks about the original SARS virus. We talk about the SARS coronavirus, but not about the SARS, the original SARS virus, which caused such panic briefly, because it didn't actually lead to the worldwide pandemic the WHO feared, uh, and H1N1, you know, there was air or testing and all of that during those days. But luckily these diseases didn't build up to the same scale that COVID-19 has. And that perhaps is the issue. Nonetheless, if we remind ourselves of the impermanence and transience of all things, and the disease has been a feature of the human landscape from the beginning, I think we can get a certain comfort from it in terms of affirming the inevitability of something or the other occurring to disrupt that externally tranquil bubble. So what does the Buddha recommend? I mean, if all life is sorrow, the first noble truth, uh, ultimately sorrow, I mean, he's not denying that there are transient states of pleasure, but if that is indeed the case, what do we do? And of course, in Buddhism, there's a whole series of prescriptions, uh, the Eightfold Path, that, that uh, cause you to go inward and find that still calmness, that still no thing, Nibbana, the blowing out of all addictive desire. Uh, and one of the one important point that I think needs to be made here, aside from Dukkha, aside from Nibbana or Nirvana, is the fact that for the Buddha, addictive desire is behind suffering. Now, certainly we physically suffer if we're in an ICU with COVID-19. No one's denying that. But emotional suffering, my God, why has this happened to us? You know, or even my own lament about the disruption of human communication and touch and so forth. And the Buddha would say, why are you addicted? Why is there this tanha, this burning thirst, this craving for the old normal? Isn't that what's causing you suffering? You know, instead of saying right now, we have the Zoom meeting. If I torture myself endlessly by saying, but it was so much more fun standing in the UU church in West Melbourne and talking to you all. That's my addiction to that that's causing me to suffer instead of enjoying this Zoom conversation in this moment, which I could also choose to do. Uh, and I think this is a very, very important point, aside from the internal focus and the going within and the recognition of transience, the recognition of suffering, the recognition of the universality of disease, uh, the, 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 the fact that 
It's my addiction to a different order of things that's causing me emotional pain. I wish it were different. I wish I could give you a hug. I wish I could be there in person. It's this addictive wish that's causing me emotional pain. Not the physical pain of the pandemic, not, but the emotional pain is caused by this contrast that I've created in my mind between that which was pleasurable and lovely and inspiring to be with someone in, you know, physically, to be with a congregation physically. Uh, that's, that's it's causing suffering. It's not, it's not the disease. It's not this spiky little monster that's causing my emotional pain. It's me. And once I realize that, I can also start letting go slowly, perhaps, through intense meditation, perhaps, uh, of, this intense of this addiction to what is the ideal order of things or what was in the past. And focus instead on being here and now in, in a very clear-eyed way of seeing what my options are here and now. And enjoying that to the best of one's ability. Again, if you're swept away by the disease and you're in an ICU or your capacity for enjoyment is going to be very restricted. Uh, and that's okay. But while you can, you can certainly make the choice to say, I will be in the here and now instead of crying for the moon. Because it's not going to work. I'm just going to make myself unhappier and unhappier. And I think this is a great insight that we can learn from uh, the Buddhists. Um, we uh, also need to realize that there are other philosophies in the West that also center around the problem of suffering or the problem of evil. I mean, certainly Christianity devoted a whole branch of its theology and called it theodicy to explain the issue of why suffering, why unjust suffering, which is one form of evil, one powerful form of evil. We're not going to go into that for right now. Let's, let's uh, investigate a more ancient Western philosophy, and that is Stoicism. You know, a lot of people see Stoicism as being stiff upper lip, you know, uh, I've got to control my emotions, I've got to be like this, I've got to be like a frozen statue, uh, and not feel at all. Ataraxia, the, Buddha, the Stoic ideal, is seen as somehow a frozen ideal. And I think that's being monstrously unfair to the Stoics. If you read Epictetus, if you read Marcus Aurelius, if you read Seneca, you certainly don't get away with the impression that they say there's no enjoyment in life, not at all. Uh, I think their attitude uh, can best be summed up by Rhino Niebuhr's famous serenity prayer, which has been embraced by AA and the 12-step programs uh, to grant me the serenity, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The Stoics emphasize courage, courage to stand up for one's beliefs. It's actually one of their cardinal virtues. Uh, so they didn't say you can't change anything or that you have to stay in this kind of frozen, stiff-lipped uh, acceptance. No, no, no. You can change a lot of things. Uh, according to the Stoics, you can change your attitude. Most important thing you can change is your outlook and your attitude. You can also change uh, a few things. I mean, if you give up smoking, if you reduce drinking, uh, and so on and so forth, you are certainly likely to be healthy. Uh, but so and the Stoic is not denying that. He is not saying we have absolutely no control over our health. But the Stoic is saying, like the Buddhist, that there is a point beyond which we have to contend with those things over which we have no control. You know, when your body is in an ICU, when your body is in a state of radical decline in extreme old age, or when it's afflicted with COVID-19 or any other disease, then you are in, in physical crisis. So, and, and you need to face up to that. And there's no point saying, well, I can just wish this away. No, it's best to accept the what is. To, with serenity, with patience, with cheerfulness. Uh, and if that seems to be a tall order, 
that's exactly what the Stoics are as asking us to do, uh, is to accept that which cannot be changed. And so in the case of this pandemic, I think if the Stoic, if the ghost of the Stoic were to grapple with the corona monster, they would say, accept it as it is. I mean, there's not, you certainly have vaccinate yourself. I mean, Bill did something great, you know, and it's wonderful. And I'm looking forward to my own uh, jabs. So that, I mean, that's something we can do. It's within our control. Finding better vaccines for the disease or finding vaccines for the variants of the novel coronavirus. All that is highly creative. And uh, in no way are the Stoics saying, stop doing that. The Stoics are saying, but there is beyond, over and beyond that, you know, you got to wear a mask and a face bubble uh, or, you know, in order to travel by air. If I'm going to get on any international flight or any domestic flight, the restrictions are severe. And kicking against that or throwing a tantrum at the flight attendant is not going to help. Um, that, and it's certainly as a rational being, the Stoics really believe that it, the human being has a unique gift. And that is the gift of rationality, of practical wisdom. And practical wisdom implies living according to the law of nature, which means living according to the what is. Uh, so there's no point saying I have to wear this clumsy, ugly face shield that presses down on my forehead, and I can't get that any sleep on that long flight to Dubai or New York. No. You signed up for that flight. You knew what it would entail in this day and age. And so if you decided to leave the comfort of your home, practical wisdom dictates that you accept the what it is. Okay, I'm going to wear my face shield. I'm going to spend a sleepless night on this flight. It's okay. I've, I've spent sleepless nights before. You know, one more is not going to destroy me. That's the stoic attitude, you see. Um, and of course, there's, there are many other philosophies, including Taoism. And Taoism teaches us to live in harmony with nature. In fact, uh, you know, for the Taoist, uh, the disruption of that harmony and the fact that the human being has this arrogant hegemony where he or she decides that they are superior to nature and they control nature. And this is partly what's, what gives rise to diseases like COVID-19 that jump from animal to human. You know, if there weren't illegal poaching and open air markets and this feeling that the animal is simply at our disposal and nature is simply at our disposal, cut a few more trees, build more condos, uh, if it were not for that whole attitude where we see ourselves in disjunction from nature, this crisis would not have come to pass. Very quickly, I want to talk about philosophies of joy. You know, I mean, Buddhism and Stoicism perhaps offer us uh, a tranquil joy. You know, if one reaches ataraxia, if one reaches nirvana. But there are philosophies that actually differentiate sharply between happiness and unhappiness. Uh, and, oh, sorry, between happiness and joy. Uh, happiness is a conditional entity. You smile at me, I'm happy. You frown at me, I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy. COVID-19 hits me, I'm unhappy. I'm healthy, I'm happy. So it's always conditional. You know, there's nothing wrong with happiness. But on the other hand, happiness can always be yanked away from me. I have no guarantee that it will last. Joy, on the other hand, is an internally focused state of being. I Theoretically, I could be in an ICU and still in a state of joy. Now, this is something that, you know, if you go back to philosophies of joy, you really need to go back to the Hindu Upanishads. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, it says, from joy, all beings come. By joy are they sustained, and to joy they return. To ananda, joy. Ananda has been falsely translated as bliss in some English translations, and I don't like that word. You know, it's uh, there's something a little too stoned about that word. Hey man, I'm blissed out. No, in a state of joy, in a state of active, awake joy. 
nothing stoned about it at all. Uh, so that, that's Ananda, uh, the third attribute of the Brahman in, uh, in Vedanta philosophy. Uh, but the point about the, this joy is that it's not conditional. It's internal and it's not conditional. It's not based on frowns, smiles, health, disease, riches, poverty. You know, uh, of course, the Stoic would also agree that whether you're, you reach a state where whether you're rich or poor, you are still tranquil and in the middle. So with the Buddhists for that matter in their own way. But in the Upanishads, there's actually that active emphasis on joy, on feeling a sense of exhilaration. And you sense that, for example, in Christian mystics too, like uh, Meister Eckhart. Uh, Eckhart talks about joy as the attribute of God, joy along with wonder and awe, you know. Uh, and so if you're in, a, in that state of joy, no disease can touch you emotionally because you're always there. And if you look at, uh, let's say, the philosophy of someone like Nietzsche, so dramatically misunderstood by the Nazis, um, Nietzsche's Ubermensch is really someone who transcends himself or herself. The overman, if you want to use that term, is someone that transcends all the petty level of moral dualities and dichotomies, good and evil. And they've peered into the abyss caused by the decay of all values. They've peered into the abyss caused by the, the collapse of all expectations. And instead of falling into the abyss, which is a possibility, you're flirting with uh, nihilism here, after all. Uh, you rise above it, you transcend it, to become the self-transcendent one. And that is a state of joy. And for Nietzsche, it also involves acceptance. Joy involves acceptance. Dionysian, I mean, for, uh, for Nietzsche, the Di Dionysus is a symbol not of ecstatic carnal joy as much as of acceptance. A joyous acceptance of what is. You know, corona hits, that is what is. It's very stoical. I mean, a lot of people fail to see that Nietzsche is really a weird kind of stoic, perhaps gone mad. <laughs> that um, he, is <laughs> uh, he literally did go mad. But, um, but the point here is, to say, he says in one of his famous passages, to say yes to life in its strangest and hardest moments. That is the courage that I call the Dionysian. Dionysian courage is really the accept, the overflowing, life affirming joy in the what is. This is it. It's the sense of joy that you get when you listen to the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy, because that hymn to joy, what does it express? That even in the midst of suffering, I can feel that joy pulsating through me. And I had a sense of that. You know, I was involved in, in, in the 1980s, I happened to be in San Francisco, and there was this huge, humongous earthquake, 7.5 on the Richter scale, and it hit. And there was a lot of destruction. The Marina District collapsed. And there I was sitting in Golden Gate Park with a bunch of others. It was, it was packed. And we were passing around wine in little paper cups. And the San Francisco Symphony actually played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the last movement. And it was tremendous. All of us were in tears and hugging each other, just acting crazy. Um, it, because it was an affirmation, yes. I don't I trust the earth anymore, sitting on the grass. You know, you wonder nervously, are, are those tremors? Did I feel something? Uh, is that an aftershock? Um, but nothing takes away from that sense of exaltation in being alive. And that's what Beethoven captures in that movement. And that's joy. And that's Nietzschean joy. Um, and that is the quality of the overman you know, not Nazi boots uh, or the Hitler salute. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's amazing how there could be such a radical misconstruction of Nietzsche. He was certainly an elitist, but he was not a Nazi. 
And you know, someday I can talk about that at length uh, at the UUs. But this is just to give you a glimpse that there are also philosophies of joy that can help us through this crisis by taking away from what is it out there that can fulfill me? You know, what can X, Y, Z give me that's going to fulfill me to, hey, I feel this inwardly, even if the world around me is crumbling, even if I haven't touched anyone in years or in the past year, even if I'm um, unhappy, lonely, et cetera, et cetera, there is still this pulsing, fierce sense of joy that no one can take away from me. That's a little more than the stoical. I mean, it's little more than what the Stoics have to offer us, because it's not just ataraxia, it's not just a quest, uh, question of quietude, it's a question of celebrating what is. Uh, uh, Beth, are we almost at the end of, the, of, of our time, or do I have time for a few more? Uh, if you have some quick comments, and then we can take some questions if you like. Okay, yeah. Because I, I would like the, uh, knowing the feisty you used, I'd like to give you the maximum scope for questions. What I've done really is to sketch and no more than sketch. I mean, this could take a whole semester to discuss really, and it does take a semester to discuss. But I've just given you a tongue tip taste, a little sketch if you like, of possible ways of dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, which is far from being over. I mean, yes, we're, justly optimistic, I think, about the vaccines. Uh, but over and beyond that, the pandemic has not ceased. And there are all these travel restrictions and you know, returning lockdowns in the UK and elsewhere. Um, so it's not over. The, it's not curtains for the coronavirus yet. It's getting there, but it's not there yet. So how do we cope with it? And so I've offered you a smorgasbord. And I've offered you a little taste of each item there in that smorgasbord. But I've, I've not had the time, obviously, to do more than that. Uh, do you have any questions or comments, any reflective concerns? And I was so busy talking that I didn't read the chat comments. There's probably a dozen of them. Oh, yeah, that's lovely, yeah. Oh, okay. thank you so much. And let me go ahead and if you have a question, raise your hand and you can unmute. Roland, I see you first. And uh, we'll go in order. Go ahead, Roland. Uh, Roland, you muted yourself again. <laughs> you hit it twice, I think. There you I go. Blame the key, I blame the keyboard. Indeed. Um, Raj, I want to thank you again for your, your sermon. Um, I appreciated it before and even more so this time. Um, I owe this congregation another sermon, and I've been working on it. And I'm thinking you prompted some good ideas, and I appreciate that. Um, Thank you. I Thanks for sharing from, that. I diverge a little bit from your, your point of view, and I'll, I'm trying to put that together so I can articulate that. But okay. given there's a lot to think about, and I sure appreciate that. Thanks. And that was the whole point of the smorgasbord, was to tease you with these little fragments, uh, things that you could explore on your own, you know, in more detail, or perhaps I could come back and do, uh, you know, a more detailed presentation on any one aspect that I covered today. The smartest board was really to get you to think, to get the wheels turning in your head again. Yeah. And if, if it accomplished that, I am more than happy. I'm in a state of joy. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I, guess, what I, oh, I guess what I really liked is uh, what you said about Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's uh, view of uh, Dionys Dionysianism. Yeah, and Dionysus, 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 philosophy. Yeah. Um, the joy of um, appreciating just what is, and right. without any embellishment, just you know, hey, this is good stuff. You know, take a look at the sky. I get a boost out of watching the critters in the backyard, watching the stars, ants. Hey, I'm yes. here and I'm happy. I'm alive. And let's yeah. appreciate that. Let's not go. Let's not get off the deep end. No, but even if one is cast into crisis, I mean, in an ICU, it's very difficult to appreciate the blue skies and the ants and the grass because you're not seeing any of that. You're seeing this very sterile environment, these grim looking nurses, uh, the masks and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, we, the only thing you can do is to affirm the what is completely and in a state of joy. It's very difficult to do because we are 
sort of trained to, uh, and not only in the US, but worldwide, we're trained to think in terms of the happiness machine. And the happiness machine creates this constant churning of desire. I want to be well. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to be richer. I want to invest in so and so. You know, I want to travel to San Francisco in the summer. I want to, you know, see Paris and, you know, I want to go scuba diving. I, so many desires crowd us. This has nothing to do with the desire machine. You could be in an ICU. You could be. You know, you could just have lost someone who's very dear to you, a parent, a loved one, a lover. I am still in a state of joy. I appreciate the life they led and I celebrate the life they led in the midst of my tears. That's joy. That's the Dionysus. All right, I see three hands. I'm going to Linda, Cindy, then Gretchen. Linda, you're first. Hi, I'm thinking about uh, the what is, is what it is. Is, which I love, but in a family of say five members, you have varying degrees, <coughs> excuse me, of emotional ability <coughs> to, uh, allergies are gonna kill me, uh, to deal with what is, is. You have uh, maybe a grandmother who has dealt with all kinds of things is emotionally sort of free flowing, great. It yeah. is what it is, but you have a 15 year old that's been deprived of seeing friends that are going to school. <laughs> the right. ability emotionally to deal with that is entirely different for that human. So while yes. you're, you're going along, you have to consider that, that not everyone is on the same level. And it takes a lot of patience to deal with someone that is focused on what they've lost or feel that they've lost. Right. And I think a lot, the tolerance button has to come into play. Yeah. And yeah, I'd, you throw yeah. a fatal illness at anybody and your, your perceived ability to deal with that and go, it is what it is, goes out the window yeah. because circumstances change dramatically. If you're right. young and healthy, it is what it is, is very simple. Mm -hmm. But uh, at various stages of life, it gets very complicated. So right. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I mean, it's, this is not something to be accomplished overnight. It's not something to just toss off and say, well, I just accept what is. Uh, no, it takes a lot of hard work to get there, uh, no matter what one's age. I mean, I think if one is 15, one chafes at the restrictions of being locked up at home. It's just mom and dad and, and the spaghetti, uh, <laughs> you know, and chatting with one's friends on Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and Zoom. There's nothing beyond that. I mean, that can be extremely, uh, it could drive a teenager to suicide being that isolated. But uh, certainly if, one's, if, if one is older, uh, it, you know, there are other unique problems too, because you feel that sense of isolation even more. And uh, you know, here you have the cruel irony of a health crisis that tells people, senior citizens who are advised to reach out and touch and be touched, to find that love, to find friendships, to cultivate that circle of friends, don't go out, especially you, because you've got those comorbidities and you're old. Uh, stay at home. It can be, you know, it, it can be devastating because at least the teenager can visualize uh, a clear future where a future of dreams, if you like, and somehow come to terms with this one year. Uh, but for someone who's older, who also feels that life is slipping away, and that this, everything is being taken away, and also to be told that you cannot touch, you cannot hug, you cannot see your grandchildren, and uh, you got to stay at home. You can talk to your grandchildren uh, in a video call. It, yeah, it can be very, very cruel. Uh, and unfortunately, many of us have been at the receiving end of that kind of well-meaning cruelty dished out by nurses, social workers, doctors, the WHO, and so on the past year. Yeah. Larry, or uh, Beth, was there someone else before Larry? Yes, we have Cindy and then Gretchen and then Larry, I will put you third. So Cindy, go ahead and unmute. Thank you. So Raj, I have uh, two things for you. One is a, a response to your uh, comments about stoicism. So a number of years yeah. ago, my father-in-law uh, moved into an assisted living facility 
And right. after he'd been there a few months, he and my husband had a conversation and, and Rick asked him, you know, so are you happy? And yeah. Frank looked at him and he said, <laughs> he said, you know, he said, I can eat ice cream. I can read the Wall Street Journal. I can do crossword puzzles. And I have a bunch of buddies here who like to, you know, do Scrabble. And we have, you know, uh, and I have a good table for dinner. You know, we have we have good conversations at dinner, even though we don't all think the same way. He says, I'm content. That was his response. Good. I thought it was very, very, good. very beautiful and very stoic, right? You know? It is beautiful. And, and that is precisely what the stoic ataraxia is all about. That's exactly. a contentment. Nothing can really comment, take that away from me. Yeah. Uh, my other comment was in terms of something you said way back at the beginning of your talk, which is that um, we're in a situation that's very unusual in that we can't shake hands, we can't hug, we can't, you know, all of those things. There's no, not as, no direct contact. But right. that's actually not true. There is an arena in our world where that is actually the norm. And we've forgotten about that because most of us don't participate. It's government, it's local government in particular, but even, you know, we've seen, we've been watching all of us on television as we normally would. And even if we were in the Senate gallery, you know, we right. watch what goes on and we have no direct contact with these people who are speaking at us, to us, through us and making comments about our lives. And I'll say this right. from the perspective of someone who attends almost every one of my local council meetings and participates right. in local government. The norm is that if you have something to say, you wait for the proper moment in the meeting when citizens comments on non-agenda items are taken, you step up to the mic, you give your name and your address, you speak your piece, and the council is not even required to respond. So your, your, your speaking is recorded and it's part of the record, but they are not required to respond. <laughs> and one of the right exactly which which yeah. seems very odd but that actually is the norm that's how government meetings work right that's how citizen comments are taken if you've ever been to a meeting like that you know that the panel sitting up at the front they are purportedly listening but they are not responding yeah. and you have no way to force them to respond you can't you don't shake their hands generally you don't hug them you know, there's, there is no, so, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that we have learned, we have, we have all learned how to operate in an environment like that, right? So I was already used to doing that in a council meeting to figure out ways to engage across that very large gap between the microphone and the panel sitting up front and the, and the advisors sitting off to the side. I'd already figured out a lot about how to do that in the years that I've spent in council meetings. But what I discovered is that those same skills are tremendously useful on Zoom. And in fact, all of the meetings that have transferred to Zoom, those same <laughs> skills, right, right. So in, what, in, what, in some ways, yeah, but it, you we, see. <laughs> we have all learned, yes. and, and many of us have learned those skills. And that's, that's one of the most fascinating things that I find about this Zoom world is that in a way we are all now prepared to go back into our government you know, environments <laughs> and engage because we know how. So, you know, so there, there are some interesting things like that, but it is, you know, what, what we are experiencing now is something that, although it's not normal in the larger sense in that not all of us have been doing this, it's actually a skill that we have needed for a very long time. And now that we've noticed, we should be going back into that arena and engaging in a situation where it is the norm. Right, Cindy, Cindy I agree with you to a large extent. Uh, and besides council meetings, there are also other arenas. Any, any, anything that involves a bureaucracy. Kafka yes. pointed this out very clearly in the castle and in the trial, especially in the castle, that the bureaucracy has its own legal irrationality that yes. it, and it is beholden to no one. And it operates on its own procedures and rules. And you, there's an opaqueness about them too because they are not required to share that with you. Anyone who's wrestled with social security knows what I'm talking about. Anyone who's tried to get food stamps or get a student loan check knows what I'm talking about, that this is, so we're all used to those impersonal dealings, but this goes beyond impersonality. It goes into, I mean, even those council meetings, you see the council sitting there. You know, you're still within breathing distance of those people. 
you're not maintaining, uh, you know, a safe distance. You're not distancing. Uh, you are in the same breathing space. You're in the same arena. You're in the same room. Uh, and you're physically present to the other. The other is physically present to you, even though they may be trying to block you out. Because for them, this is not a human encounter at all. It is the bureaucracy versus you. And you are a nobody for them. Uh, but this is a little different. This uh, carries it one octave higher. The idea that there's no physical human being left. I mean, it's, it's almost as if one is talking to flickering images on one screen. The Arthur monitor Arthur is all. Arthur C. Clarke wrote about this. He wrote about this. Arthur C. Clarke wrote about this. Yes. 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 And it's actually manifesting. And that's very scary. This goes beyond the Kafkaesque bureaucracy, beyond the government uh, council meeting, though I agree with you that some of the skills that we've garnered on Zoom can come in handy when we go back to those live council meetings with or without a mask on, hopefully without a mask in two, year, two years from now. But, uh, but the point is this, what we've gone through the past year is in many, many ways unique, similar to a lot of other experiences, but not the same at all. Uh, yeah. All right, let me get a couple more people in here. Gretchen, you're next. Go ahead on mute and then Larry. Make sure you're unmuting. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, mine's a little bit different uh, comment and question. Um, going back to what you were speaking about in the beginning um, and the other parts that you spoke about joy. Uh, with the eternal, but but you were talking about addictive desire and um, the way um, to release that or to be free of that is to, through meditation and obviously getting more in the presence. As someone who used to live on an ashram um, and contemplating living in an ashram again in the next few years, do you feel that society or media or where we live in the city makes us have this addictive desire and that yeah. for people seeking that inner joy that going someplace else is going to help them do that? I, I think to a large extent that is true because I think the happiness machine is created by the media. It's created by high school, by peer groups, by parents, by all the people who tell us to be ambitious in certain sorts of ways. You know, it's created by all of that, this whole externally hankering, craving reality, psychological reality of who we are, is definitely owes a great deal to others. And so getting away from them, whether in nature or whether in an ashram or wherever else, or even just to one's own room with the door firmly locked, uh, and a, a sign outside that says, keep out, please. Uh, and then just going into a state of meditation can do that because you really need to bracket out the world, to bracket it out to as if it does not exist in order to tap the sense of joy or even at a lesser level to find that ataraxia, to find that inner peace. Thank you. That inner contentment, yes. Uh, good luck in your yes. in, in your next ashram adventure. Oh, thank you, Larry. Larry go ahead. Yeah, th thank you. I would love to get to Kaji. I guess you could spend the night there. You know, it's, it, it's a great place. Yeah, you know, we've had a a fairly reasonable experience this whole year. Of, of course, our we're getting older and we're not traveling, but. And I really appreciate your coming again, Raj. I, I think I think about a presentation Beth gave you know, early on the, the different love experiences groups within the pandemic. For those people that are not connected, for those people who are on the edge of eviction, or millennials who just have their whole futures changed. So we have these different kinds of experiences depending on which group right. we're in. Yes, we do. And so that, I, I just think of that, and I think of India, too, as 
being widely disparate as far as the kind of experiences people are having. And um, I'm really glad that that package passed tonight, last night. And there have been some things to be happy about that I don't have to be in despair. Yeah, right. And I think Biden's election uh, way before the passage, uh, passage of the Corona stimulus package, just his election and everything that he stands for, he may not be Bernie Sanders, but on the other hand, we've at least got half a loaf. And that's pretty good. That's pretty damn good. And I, for one, am profoundly grateful that we've seen the last of Trump for now. So, so we have reasons why we can experience those moments of joy or, or be yeah. grateful. Yes, if, if, but again, it, it takes that conscious inner choice to focus on those moments. Like even in the ICU, I could focus on a little ant in the corner or you know, the way the sunlight comes in through that one window. Uh, yeah, Victor Frankl points this out in uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And here's this Jewish psychotherapist who's actually in a Nazi concentration camp who finds consolation in that ray of sunshine on the grimy windowsill of his camp window. Uh, you know, he finds consolation in the fact that someone has remembered that it's his birthday and has saved a half crust of old stale bread, you know, so that he can have a little more to eat at lunch. Uh, that, that, to my mind, you do make those choices. So in a sense, joy, but joy is not triggered by the outside. The sun could shine on that grimy wind, windowsill. People could give you any number of pieces of bread and you could still go, ah, God, that's nothing at all. To hell with it. I'm miserable. Uh, and you could choose to be that way. But you could also choose to say, my God, that's a miracle. Yes, I am going through hell. I am going through this Nazi concentration camp. And yet, I choose to focus on the few things that can stimulate, can push the joy button in me. And the joy button is here. It's not caused by the happiness industry at all. The happiness machine has nothing to do with it. Absolutely. I think that leads into Eugenie's question. Eugenie, go ahead. Hi, Raj. Uh, thank you, Beth. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so I was curious, Raj, um, did you, uh, oh, well, who coined the phrase um, happiness machine? Is Was that, uh, you know, your own original uh, synthesis or uh, have you have you seen it somewhere? No, actually there, it's been a philosophical debate for a while. And suppose that you could be strapped up to a machine. And actually that can be done now with all the advances we've made in digital technology. Uh, and your brain is wired you know, in a certain kind of way and hooked up to these machines. You feel the sense of pleasure constantly. Uh, uh, philosophers call it the pleasure machine. The pleasure machine, okay. And, but and the happiness machine... I broadened it a little bit to 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 talk about the happiness machine and the happiness machine, not just and the, the way in which I made that variation on the traditional pleasure machine concept is that the happiness machine is created by industry and it's created by all the companies that want to keep us in a state of unsatisfied desire till we get that latest model iPhone. I mean, I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it's so interesting. I, I, I get it. And, and it, you know, there was lots and lots of things to take away today. But that one, I think, was very key. And um, and it, it, it kind of makes a whole lot of things in, in my own worldview suddenly click. Because um, I've been studying mindfulness and Buddhism a little bit. And, and, and I, understood, I understood what said about you know us kind of creating our own suffering by this addictive desire which exactly is stoked by that happiness machine and i think yeah. i think um the, the the kids you mentioned the kids today and 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 we're so um you know the whole facebook thing right where everybody's oh, yeah. like oh look what i'm doing look what i'm doing isn't this wonderful aren't i great and you know and then it just 
it that is really a part of that happiness machine that I think oh yeah sure creates that sense of longing uh, and what I'm missing out on for the people who are susceptible and, right. and, and can't come back to that that inner joy and I think I remember I remember feeling as a five year old right when when television became a thing right and right. And I and I sent you know the advertising. I was skeptical right then. Like I was like, what, you know, why why is this a thing? Why why are they trying to make us want Mr. Peanut Peanut Butter Maker? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell yeah. that doesn't work. <laughs> so, and if I don't get that peanut peanut butter maker, I'm profoundly unhappy. Well, yeah, what ha- exactly. I, I, it triggered in me exactly the opposite. I looked at that and I thought, oh gosh, I really hope I don't get that for Christmas. Right? <laughs> and guess what showed up under the tree? <laughs> My mom must have seen the commercial and thought, oh, the kids will love that, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Very That's good. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I love that term. I'm glad you broadened the pleasure machine because it will really help me uh, just understand what's going on. And uh, I've been cultivating that, that inner, trying to find that inner joy that you spoke about. I experienced it the first time sitting on my lawn chair with headphones on, listening to Thich Nhat Hans, one of his guided meditations where he talked about, you know, breathing and that heaven, heaven is right here, right now. We don't have to wait for it later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and I think that's when I first like connected. Yeah, I can come back to this whenever I like. Yeah. Yeah. And and no one can take it away from you. It's <laughs> also you spoke about Facebook and uh one thing i do want to say is that you can reframe facebook for example there have been buddhists and others as you probably know who use facebook not as a way of sharing their vacations or see how gorgeous i am but sharing quotes from the buddha or creating a sort of a little discussion group a forum uh yeah so there are pages and pages and facebook and facebook uh you know i use it for a long time i used it as inspirational quotes from different masters of different traditions yeah and then i would say something very provocative and of course people would jump on me and disagree partially agree or say wow and you sometimes uh, you know, it's like, I used to be all quite addictive. I used to do that every day. But the point was not to show, well, uh, see what a great time I'm having, but hey, let's think this through together. I disagree with the Buddha when he says this. What do you think? Right, right. Uh, I, 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 didn't, yeah. I didn't mean to, you know, say that Facebook is all bad. I, I just meant that, you know, it's it's part of, I think, it could no, be. No, but the standard of- use, that, but that's a very atypical. That's a very atypical user of Facebook. I think a minority, perhaps 10 to 15% of Facebook users use it for spiritual or cultural or philosophical discussions or forums. I think a lot of people use it much more like Instagram as a way of narcissistic self-gratification because you're looking at your own images. And at the same time, you want others to, there's almost a compulsion uh, if you're, someone's friend well they posted this i've got to like it uh and so it goes all right i'm gonna have to jump in here we're running uh, a little late so i appreciate you talking to us as 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 usual beth yeah i'm around i'm indeed (laughs) we always have a good conversation i hate to end it but uh we got to move on for a little bit and uh i appreciate you coming today we appreciate you have uh you being with us you talking with us i'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now